missed a lot of technical complications actually, so we're a lot happier with this now. But of course this first session was recorded, so you will be able to watch that later. So in the second part of um, the Makerspace teaching in a no or low resource classroom, we're actually going to go more into the practical part. So we're going to look at how to create resources and use them, and also how to build activities from existing low resources or little resources that we have. So basically, um, Julie's going to start off coming back to the most available resource in the low resource classroom. If you're in a prison, in a refugee camp or wherever, there's plenty of stuff in, packed in boxes. These boxes are usually thrown away, but of course there are a lot better ideas what to do with the box. Um, Julie's going to talk about one of them and then ask you to join us in what else can you do with the box. Let me just speak something a bit louder, but I think it's okay. Okay. So, uh, we did mention the Theatre of Dreams in the first half, and I'm just going to go to it again because some of you weren't here and we were having a few technical problems. So, the Theatre of Dreams is basically a cardboard box. Here it is. And if you open up the box, you've literally got the heading, Theatre of Dreams, and a little bit of decoration. It's painted pink inside. And it says, enter the dream here. I think you can see that. So I actually created the Theatre of Dreams and I gave it a title. But what you could do with your students is take a box, get the kids to paint the box, and maybe you can mention the idea of a theatre or a cinema or a space and give them the word dream and see where they take it. So. Some of the names that people are using a lot in relation to when they're teaching refugees is, is actually dream, dream space, dream maker. Um, and so um, give it to the kids and say, well, what could we do in the dream space? How could we, or how could we make a theatre of dreams? Who could the people be in the dreams? And in my theatre, we've got little yogurt pot men. Again, the kids could come up with that idea, give them some you know, the materials that you've got and get them to come up with the idea. One other idea is to take the theatre of dreams and turn it into a shadow theatre. So um, moving on from that, I created a yep, the shadow theatre rabbit. And we're just going to show you how I did that because it was made out of, again, it's the same old cardboard box. So we'll just share the video with you. Oh, that's oh you got not, yeah, yeah, that's okay. So that's not go back to the spider. No, that's oh. the spider again. I hope so. That's it. Okay, here we are. So here's just a short video. I want to show you how to make some shadow puppets. So we've got an old chocolate over it because keyboard box. We've got an old keyboard box. I cut the sh the shape out of a rabbit. Use the the cardboard as as your as your stencil. And then obviously leave it to dry. I am, I'm talking on the video because I think the sounds are a little bit um, faint. Um, and you might have to obviously help kids cut things out. And you, you don't have to start with such complicated things. But there we have a shadow puppet just with a, a I think it's a lollipop stick. But you could actually use um, twigs and sticks and what, whatever is available to hand. You can also use pieces of cardboard. So you've got your cardboard box, cut a piece of cardboard box, stick it on the back and you're ready to go. So, um, what else could we do with the cardboard box? I mean, you've got the, the idea of a theatre, but I mean, you know, this is probably the main resource that you've got in a, in a camp um, or in a school, for a matter of fact. There's always lots of cardboard boxes. What else could you do um, with the cardboard box? Any ideas? And what else could you do if you made it into a theatre or a cinema? Can you use the chat function? Can you use the chat function just to share your ideas? So, you know, what else could we do with those boxes? What, what other space could we make? So a few people are typing away there.
Okay, a jigsaw puzzle with cardboard. Okay, yeah, jigsaw puzzle, flashcards, um, shapes, pictures cut into shapes. Um, yeah, you're all talking about what you can make with the box, but how could we use a box, for example, as a resource in the classroom? So, I mean, this is an actual space, uh, a dream box. Could we make any other kind of boxes that the kids could um, use? A surprise box. Yeah, that's great. A surprise box. So what's in the box? What surprises are in the box? Um, maybe a wish box. What kind of wishes? What, what, what could you put in the box? What would be a, a, an idea for a wish or a reward box? Anything else? Story box. Yeah, story box is great. So what about a writing suggestions box? Fantastic. Okay. Um, so yeah, surprise boxes, wish boxes, dream boxes, lots of different ideas there. And then of course obviously you can cut up the box and you can make your flashcards. You can make story jigsaws, jigsaw cards that fit together, the kids fit them together and make the story. So many uses with just a simple, simple, simple resource. So Kirsten wants to uh, talk about, yeah. yeah. So um, talking about the surprise box or the writing suggestion box. So this is something where like once you created your resource, you have to think about what kind of activities can I use with this. So of course I can put certain kind of say vocabulary or topics in and then ask students once they're more advanced in the English to pick one and uh, create a story out of that. But if the box is big enough, you can also take objects that are available in the classroom pencils, books, paper, or kind of like maybe food items, smaller items, clothes items, whatever, and put them in the box, talking about the element of surprise, and the students have to pick a piece of thing from the box and describe it. So revising adjectives, you know, color, functions, what you can do with it, and whatever. So they can do that with the other students turning their back, so they have to guess which object they picked from the box. Now, so that would be also a surprise box. So you can also use it for very practical matters. And you can use the box again. The same like once they get a bit better at English, you can think about uh, using this also for vocabulary. So they pull a word and they have to explain that word and the other students have to guess the word. So this is something, of course, that um, is very good. And if you use it for inside of a home, as Lisa is suggesting, then of course what you can also do is get them to picture that, you know, give them like the clips from the IKEA catalog or whatever, make them cut the things out, put them in the box, and learn to describe the home. Yeah, so they can re recycle their own home, create a new home for them, for their family, or something like this, and use the pictures and the objects to improve the vocabulary, but to also talk about what their dream home would look like. Yeah? So these are the kind of activities that you can just follow up on from the box when you talk about this. And I think now Julie is going to demonstrate some more things that can go into the box. At least it looks very intriguing what she's preparing here, so I hand back over. Okay, actually I was just playing with my bin bag. I have a bin bag full of resources and I think a lot, you know, a lot of you will know the Mary Poppins film. Um, Mary Poppins had a bag. Even such a thing as a bin bag could be used as a surprise bag. You know, what's in the bag today? So, and the same in the, if you're thinking about um, upsourcing materials, what have we got in the bag and what could we make with it today? So. Um, just going back to the box for a moment, if you paint the outside of the boxes, you know, make them very colourful, they will also add to your classroom space, you know, to make it cosy. So they could actually be made into dice. You could have alphabet dice made of boxes. And or you can have your wish box, your suggestion box, your surprise box, and you can say to the kids, get let's get the dream box out and what can we do with it? So uh, boxes can also be used for storage. You can put the things that you make into the dream box. Um, think going back to my theatre, um, if you put the box up this way, then we could make holes in the top of the box 
and we could use the yogurt pots as puppets. So here are my yogurt pots. I couldn't find my yogurt pot men. I think they've run away. But if you put some holes through them, and I mean, actually we're having a, a yogurt pot man made at this very moment, um, you could actually put them onto strings and they could be dangled as puppets. So, you know, again, let the kids go with it. Say today you have some yogurt pots, some egg cups, and what can we do in the theatre? What can we make? Um, one other idea I want to put to you is these are actually a different kind of yogurt pots. They're kind of bumper yogurt pots. And what you can do with these, if you've got a permanent pen, um, is you could write a face. I don't know if you've got one. Okay, we have got one. I don't know how good I can do this. But anyway, we put a little face on that. And again, this is going to be a fantastic resource for teaching vocabulary because I'm not going to draw it on. I'm going to pass the pen back. But if on another one you actually put clothes, you could put, you know, trousers, shoes, and then when you turn it around, you could change the clothes. Uh, you could also put a third one on. And you could add on the hair. So this could be a man that's bald, he's got long hair, he's got short hair, whatever. So, um, you know, just to give you the basic idea there, that could be a fantastic resource. And you could get the kids to make it. So start up with little people and give them, uh, they can tell a story um, of this person that, you know, has his hair cut and then it grows back or whatever. So very simple thing with, with yogurt pots there. Um, So I'm going to move on to Brain Gym now and there are some amazing activities you can use to actually get kids calmed down initially, relaxing, involved and obviously whole brain activity. Yeah, I think somebody's saying oh, it is useful in this, but I think you can use this with all ages of kids. Um, as soon as they can draw a, a stick man, you can, you can get them to do it. Or with younger kids, they, they might be at the stage where they can just draw a little head. You can still do it. Um, so just to go back to the, the brain gym, um, there are some amazing classic activities that you can use to get kids, uh, the whole brain, get the body, the brain, the whole thing working together. And the first one is the Lazy 8 activity. Now this is an amazing activity again to show, uh, to do with kids when you're not really sure if they can even write numbers. And I just want to explain, I know we've got the drawing there, but the way to get kids doing this is by putting the paper in landscape form and then you actually get them, I mean I'll explain it to you, to do an 8 but they really start with a C and then it's like a, they start at the top of the C from that movement. So they start with the C and then it's like a backwards C. So once they've got that movement, they keep going and they just keep following the eight. So this is a, a great activity for actually engaging the whole brain and also it's coordination. You can see how, how well they can write and you can see if they can draw numbers. Um, so the Lazy Eight is a great activity to start off calming the students if you're in a very disruptive classroom. You can do it with adults as well. It's just it's just like doodling really, and we will be talking about doodling later. You know, something that calms the mind, gets you settled down, and uh, focused on the lesson. And I'm already feeling really calm now, and I've only done half an eight. So if you do um, lots of them. Now the next thing I want to talk about is this wonderful piece of string. Now you may not have such a sophisticated piece, it's actually elastic, um, but I'm sure you can pick up a piece of string or normal elastic. And I think a lot of you will know this game. Do any of you know what you can do with an elastic as a physical whole brain activity? Any ideas? Yeah, can you, can you write in the chat box? I could wear it as a necklace, but that's not the correct answer. Um, so anyway, I'm going, to, I'm going to move on because let's see if anyone's got it. So here we are, it's just a simple piece of elastic, very colourful one, but this is an amazing activity to get kids involved in the brain gym, get them focused, get them active, get them working in a group. 
So, yeah, the name of the activity is actually French skipping. Um, now, I'm not going to go into how you do French skipping, but it involves getting all the kids inside the elastic. So they physically get inside the ropes, they get their feet inside the ropes, and one foot on either side. But I'm not going to go into the game because it will take quite a long time. We have got some great um, instruction sheets that I got from the Fun Learning Factory. And at the end of the session, um, we'll put up a link to uh, Heart ELT to the website. We can put those on there and you can download them. So we've got some great um, worksheets and one of them is how to use the French skipping elastic and different ways that you could use that with the kids. But now, as you can see, um, Kirsten is very athletic and she was demonstrating how to play a great uh, activity for the whole brain, which is Twister. So, can I ask, first of all, who of you is actually familiar with Twister, which is, I think, for British and American kids, one of the greatest uh, games, but I'm not really sure if uh, how well this is played outside um, the UK. So, can you just put in the chat if you're familiar with Twister or not? Okay. <laughs> Jen, I take that to be a yes. So, Stefania Rose says, I'm not. What about the others? Okay, and he says? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's so, yes. okay, so that's two yes, one no, and some maybe not. Um, okay, so Twister is basically, you play this with more than one person to make it more interesting. You get instructions that you have to put, in this case, your left foot on green, your right foot on yellow, your blue, your right hand on blue, and your left hand on red, and then you have to move. The problem is there are other people in the way. And this is again an activity, especially in a classroom where you can't expect students to sit still the whole time. Um, and I was wondering, can you put into the chat box what kind of activities could I use Twister for? Where could I use this kind of movement? What could I teach with Twister using that kind of format? So, can you put your ideas there? Okay, great. Yeah, so left, right, of course. Yeah, so moving left, moving right, following instructions, basically, which is great for listening. Mm -hmm. Numbers, of course, yes, like move to the first, second, third square. Basic colors, that's, I think, quite obvious. Okay, anything else? Yeah, exactly, instructions. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, movements. Also body parts. Yeah, so something like foot, arm, leg, hands. Teamwork, exactly. So a, a huge subtext of the whole low resource classroom, talking about extreme situations, is of course um, thinking about increasing social skills, building teamwork, building a kind of classroom community. Good, up, down, body parts, and so on. And this is also a great one really for, for warming up and taking some of the kind of maybe negative energy or this kind of unsettledness out. You can also use this in the middle of the classroom if, if students really need to move because this is actually quite a complex activity. Great. So that's actually Twister. I also sometimes use this to teach different sets of vocabulary. So the instructions actually include like if you hear this and that word, then move your hands to this and that part. And you can also have the students communicating with each other. So Twister is a great fun activity. And um, it's again something you can take into the classroom because it's just this big piece of mat which doesn't weigh anything. So we have here two other things. We already talked about the bag, what is in the bag. I explained that earlier. Um, so you can use that also. All you need is a bag for vocabulary, looking at objects again, teaching certain functions. And one great activity that I like, and I think Stefania was asking, can I also use this at middle school? Um, musical chairs is a great activity. Um, it has different names in different countries. The idea is basically you hear some music, and when the music stops, the kids have to sit down. And from like in each round, you move one chair away, so it's always like one person is 
leading the group. So that's the original idea. Um, however, in an English setting, English classroom setting, I do this differently. So I use this with grown-ups, and I have them uh, revise vocabulary with that. And can you tell me how you would do that using musical chairs? How can I teach vocabulary using this kind of activity, going around, sitting down, one person has to lead the group? How, how could I use that to teach vocabulary or revise vocabulary, maybe? Can you put your ideas in the chat? Yes, change places if you're, mm -hmm. yes, you can create a different set. Okay. Exactly. So they sit when they hear words related to a certain topic. So you mentioned earlier, for example, the idea of like the home. So if you do vocabulary of a house or vocabulary of food, you create a random list of words, and whenever they hear a food word, they have to sit down. Right? So they have to pay a lot of attention because they have to move round all the time. And that is something or sorry, is this Okay, the sound seems to be okay. Stefania can't hear me. Are you okay now? Is it better? Can, can you just type into the chat if you can hear me okay? Because we had uh, problems with the sound earlier on. Okay, some kind of echoing. Okay, good. So, um, so basically, you can use this to revise sets of vocabulary. You can also use this, for example, to play change places or something like this. Okay, good. Um, so that's something like that. Then um, the mic is plugged in, but we had the problems earlier, and he says nothing we can do, unfortunately, about that. So, but I can just try maybe to move the mic a bit or not to speak that loudly. Is that better? Okay, good. So that's just me. Um, I shouldn't speak too close to the mic. Good. Okay. So another thing, so what is in the back is, of course, also vocab cards. And another activity that I want to introduce to you now is something that we explained in the first part. We use um, flashcards in a different way. So you see here blue cards. And what can you see on the cards? What types of words? They're all verbs. So, and it's not enough, sorry, it's not enough to have the verbs. You actually put in the past simple form on the back. So that like you, not you, that you can see that, that's like cook, cooked. And of course you have then two different sets of verbs. So you have the regular forms, yeah? so the past simple of the regular verbs. But you also have, so you have swam, swim, swam. So you have the irregular verbs. And what I do with my students is actually I get them to create stories. Yes. Now it's the, so you just put the past form on it, and then you make sure that like the first thing is they sort the regular and the irregular verbs. So they make two heaps. So they put cooked, so it's best to come on one side, and they put swam on the other. And then you get them to create stories. So all the verbs that they've just sorted, and they have to pass simple forms there, they have to start building a story with. And so it's a very basic storytelling activity that's great for grammar without using complex grammar explanations or a grammar textbook. Yeah? So and that's actually exactly. So you create stories with the verb flashcards. And this is very simple because they create the story. So first they have to think about what are the past simple forms. They learn stories are created in the past simple, which isn't normal regarding their first language. Very often stories are told in the present simple. And then they can actually build the story together, and they must use all the verbs, and each student, for example, creates one sentence. So this is one very simple use of flashcards. And again, for different, color, for, for different words, you use different colored paper. So you can repeat the activity with adjectives or nouns or something like this. So flashcards can also be used, of course, to teach adjectives. 
uh, and contrast. So these are the ones that you can get for free if you write to the publisher. We put the link on Heart EOT. So what is the flashcard teaching? So can you tell me what you think is, it's teaching? I can give you another one. Oops. So what words are we teaching here? Okay, so it's nothing coming really. Oh, okay, sorry. This. Yeah. So. Okay, sorry about the voice. So um, I think the, there is a problem with the mic because I try to speak at the same level. So it's about adjectives and it's actually like contrast adjectives. You have full, empty, or you have this one which is like cheap and expensive. And again, you can use the flashcards then to help the kids create stories on that. Okay, so that is something where we do something with games and I hand back to Julie to talk about hopscotch. Okay, uh, well hopscotch is one of the oldest games um, that kids play with chalk and numbers and we did do a blog on HeartLT about hopscotch with the history of hopscotch and also a little background information about it. But basically, somebody told me that hopscotch is, is, is the game that uses the most um, physical and mental functions. You know, to, up to a certain age, some kids just can't do it. It's actually very difficult to hop on one leg and lean down to pick up a little bag, which is what kids do. Now, the traditional hopscotch, I'm sure you all know, the, you can see the photos there, with numbers. But there are lots of other ways that you can use hopscotch um, and you can actually have again uh, as Chris was saying you could use post-it notes you could use cards and get the kids to um, you know pick up words as they reach down and then when they finished we you know what words have you got and what can you do with those words so you can make a sentence you can make a story so we could have picture cards we could have words we could have adjectives you can focus on particular things and perhaps you can have a number and a card so again it, it's very very flexible and I know that actually in areas where people haven't even got chalk and a, a pavement you could be in the middle of a, a jungle somewhere but you've got sticks and stones and pebbles so you can do this game anywhere in the world and it with absolutely no activities and particularly for kids who don't have a lot of physical activities in refugee camps for example um, it's a great game that as a kind of whole brain thing because you're jumping, you're walking, you're looking, you're engaging and you're reaching down. So hopscotch is a, is a great one. Um, if you have a look on the Heart World Tea blog, you'll see a lot more information about hop, um, hopscotch. And um, so let, we're going to talk about some other games in a moment, aren't we? And I think that... I wanted to ask what we can teach with hopscotch, which... Yeah, okay. I mean, you know, what else do you think we could actually teach with hopscotch? Because we've obviously got, I think we've got 10, we've got 10 squares. I think there are 10 squares, aren't there, with hopscotch? So what could we do with those 10 squares? Or any ideas what else we could could do with them? Again, you can, you can talk in the chat box about this. Any ideas what else we could do with hopscotch? Well, you know, adverbs, adjectives, names of animals perhaps. Someone's writing something there. Stephanie is writing. Uh, to improve the use of verbs, yeah, again you could do um, verbs, you could practice past tenses, you could practice present tenses. And we're going to talk about songs in a minute and we can actually talk about that when we come on to Jason's talking about some of Jason Levine's songs, can't we, Kirsten? Because uh, in one of his songs yeah. he actually talks about verbs and that might give you some ideas for how you could utilise it in hopscotch. So we're going to move on now to the um, next slide. Um, and Kirsten's going to talk... Oops, we've gone on too far. Uh, Kirsten's going to talk about playboards. 
So basically what we were discussing earlier was of course the idea that um, we have to make sure that we involve and engage our learners in any way possible. So learners lead dumb, dumb way is, I think that's actually the way, I don't know what the M is doing there. <laughs> so for example, um, we have class activity playboards which are fold up um, sheets. Actually I think Julie's just going to pick one. And you can fold them up and then you get the whole thing which looks like this. And the idea is basically that the children draw their own activities onto them and give the instructions what you have to do at each step. This is where the post-it notes that I mentioned earlier come in very handy because you write the instruction or they write the instruction on the post-it note and then they fix the post-it note like this. They fix the post-it note onto the square. So for example, if the start is S, then they can write the instruction Right, like find an animal that starts with us, put it on here. So the person who uh, rolls the dice and ends up on the field have to think about an animal with us, for example. So um, you can also use numbers, you can use different kind of activities, but the key thing here is they create the whole thing together. Yeah, so it's again, before they start, they actually create the game. And if you use the post-its, you only need one of these sets. And you can recycle that and give them like 20 different games or something like this. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about two other set of games. Another great one, which you can also get uh, for free from, from TAG, is matching pairs. In this case, we have a situation card. And this card comes together with the noun that's written. So when you so there are like 24 cards, so when you put, I think you have to hold it like this, when you put the cards there, then basically the kids can go and um, find the cards, so they find the picture and the activity, like, so they learn the hope, which is the noun, and they learn the verb to hope, like let's hope for, so how do I use the verb in a sentence? And then once they've done this, there is a second set where later on you show them the, the card again, which is without the words, and then ask them, so what word is represented, and try to talk a bit about hope, get them to talk about things. So it's again where you use cards, simple cards, that they can hopefully relate to, even though I find they look a bit like the minions, um, and they can actually go and create activities from them, and you create the activities with them together. So and we talked about word clouds. And here I have an activity for you. So, because we can't create these big word clouds as you can do that with your iPad or whatever, but of course you can do this with a piece of paper. So you see here the word cloud for food. Can you just, in two minutes, write down as many words that you can relate to the word food and the chat box, and I will copy them onto the word cloud. So start writing. Are you? One minute, but I think it takes a while to get through on the chat. So, okay, grapefruit, that was quick, Jen. Okay. That's a nice one. What fish. else? Fish. Oh, passion fruit, yeah. Fish. Lights yeah, grapefruit leads to passion fruit. Yeah, what else? Pineapple. God, is this, is that all the veggies there? It's fruity, it's very fruity. Orange. That is, there's a reason to that, and I explained that, actually. Lime. Yes. Banana? Yeah. There are no meat eaters. They're all fruitarians. Mango? Well, it happens, that's what happens to the I explained that. No, yeah. I explained that. Yeah. There's a reason for that. Why that happens. Steak, yeah. <laughs> Steak. Chips. Okay. Strawberry? Chips. Chips. Okay. Mustard? Steak. Yeah, mustard, steak and chips. Oh my I, God. I want. Okay. And we go for one more? Yeah, fish exactly. You can't chips. have fish, out, fish without chips. Exactly. Nah, Good. Okay. So basically, um, what I, of course, started doing, and I hope you can see this okay. Just try to get this. Yeah, I think that should be okay. Is what you have done is actually associations. So as soon as somebody comes up with a fruit, especially grapefruit, everybody comes up with fruits as well, especially from the same family, like orange and lime, or pineapple and strawberry. So when you do the word cloud, you can already start clustering the words, 
So fruit in general, special kind of citrus fruits, or you can make associations like fish and chips. So what actually happens is once the kids start talking, they start building associations and chains. So they connect vocabulary, which is very useful for their brain. And the good thing is you keep the word clouds. I would recommend using larger uh, flip chart paper or something. This is too small. But you can keep the word clouds. And in every session, when you have more words from this field, you just add it to the word cloud and make it visible so that the kids can always look at this. Yeah, so Um, sorry, we lost the internet connection for about a second or so. Oops, exactly. So that's what we like, but it just reconnected, so I hope we're all back. Okay, so that's something where you can use um, basic um, game activities, which you may use from classrooms or know from classroom activities anyway, but that's something you can actually do. So, okay. Um, that's something where we are more into the gaming part, which I'm a big fan of. And now we move over, I hand over to Julie for the doodles. And after that, I do the drawing activity because it connects to the doodles. So, okay, now I'm going to talk about. Um, another thing that's great for doodles is doing um, finger painting. And there you can see in the picture um, some fingerprint men. So they, they are literally, I mean, kids love finger paints. Um, you do a fingerprint and the kids turn them into men. So again, kids are amazing, these things. So you can say, look at, the, let's do some fingerprints or let's do some handprints and turn them into animals, turn them into birds, turn them into people. And these can be amazing. In fact, there's a wonderful book about doing drawings with um, fingerprints. And in the next session, we're going to do a lot more on creating artwork, um, but not the teacher creating it, how to just stimulate the kids to create stuff. So we'll be doing handprints, fingerprints, doodles, blurbs, blobs, all of those kind of things. Um, so this is just to get you started in the next session. We'll go into that a lot more. Um, and I got to go back for a moment because yep. Kirsten's just going to say something about um, her picture story. So, and like me, a lot of people are not great artists. I mean, Julie is, so she's perfect at that. But I'm more the kind of like, I'm happy if you recognize things, if you remember the spider in the video. So, but of course, when we start with doodling, we start with drawing and painting. And we always encourage kids uh, to draw. But um, the thing is then, um, how do we tell how do we turn this drawing into an activity? Now, again, for you to think about this for two minutes, you see here a drawing I created myself. Very nice picture. Um, so what kind of activities can you use here to build on that drawing in an English teaching classroom? So how could you use that? Put your ideas in the chat box, please, and then we discuss that for a couple of minutes. Yes. Hello again, Cheryl. Uh, okay, yes, um, there are two birds. They're supposed to be two birds, yes. Okay, I can ask them to add things, good, like people, animals. What else? Think about it like it's, it's also about teaching English. So how can I use this to teach English? Yeah, so I can add rain. So basically, I can add things to this, and then I can start telling the story of the picture. Yeah, so that would be the thing. But what a colleague of mine did, Nick Bogoro actually did this uh, with his teaching project in a refugee camp in Palestine, is um, he talks to one of the students, and he has her describe the picture, but he cannot see the picture, and he tries to paint the same picture from the description. And when she can't describe it, he asks a question. So, are there trees in the picture? Are there animals in the picture? If animals, are there birds and something like this? So he guides her through the description if the vocabulary, if the language skills aren't that great yet. And this is something you can do. So you try to recreate the picture without the person being able to see this. What you can also do is you put the picture on a wall somewhere, get the students to go there, and everyone goes back and tells the person who draws the copy picture one piece of the picture. So, um, okay, so sorry about that. The, 
Um, okay, so with a video, your computer crashed. I think the chat is recorded, so you should be able to see this in the recording as well, because the chat is part of the recording channel, so don't worry about that. So you can also have them, people describe the picture, so like there's a house, describe the house, there are flowers, there are animals, and you describe where things are. So you also got a great group activity going, where again they try to recreate the picture that somebody has drawn together. Yeah, and again, that's like where the students with the different skill sets can greatly support each other. Um, so they, they practice listening, comprehension, understanding what is said, and also like having great kind of physical activities with the drawing, and that can be um, done very easily with something as simple as that. So this takes us basically to the last part, where we talk about another thing that a lot of us are not very good at, some people are, which is actually singing songs in the classroom. And this is something a lot of people find very embarrassing. So I always get my students to sing. I never sing myself. Um, but again, if you think about having a good USB, easy to use loudspeaker, on your smartphone, on your tablet, you have the voice memo recording. Make use of that. Record the songs with the, that you make with your students and get them to create this. And Julie's going to talk about some song activities that are available to teachers. And we're going to have an example with a video that hopefully does not crash anything. OK. You want to show the video first? Um, I'll just talk. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. OK, so um, I just want to talk about uh, some songs that are available on the internet. And although you might not always have the internet, they might give you some ideas of how to use songs in the classroom. Now, um, Jason Levine, um, otherwise known as Fluency MC, uses rap in the classroom and in a, in a really inventive way to get kids interested in things like grammar points, verbs, um, and you know, get them totally involved and um, to help them relax, to help them remember um, his motto is relax, re repeat and remember. So, um, and it, you know, they've seen, I've seen a lot of the sessions where there have been like 500 kids doing his um, songs and they, they just love it. And in fact, Hearty LT have created, um, have published a book of his lyrics and it's called Hope, Peace, Respect. And it's now available online. If you, uh, it's available at Celtic Bookstore. To uh, I'll just give it a quick plug there. Um, so um, we're going to just show you this video of how Jason's used uh, a song. Was it for Irregular Verbs? No, for no, it was for Have. And we wanted to show you that, and then um, he's a part of this. So. Um, Bear with us for a moment. So, Jason R. Levine, also known as Fluency MC, mm -hmm. and today we're going to do Could speaking to practice with yeah. the verb have. Fluency. Fluency. It's Fluency MC. Oh, oh, listen. I have a feeling most of you understand the grammar of have, but you need speaking practice to improve your pronunciation and so you can remember and use this grammar with accuracy and fluency. Okay, here we go. First, just listen to the flow. Do you have time to meet? Yes, I do. I have time to meet. How about we go out to eat? Do you have money to pay? No, I don't. I don't have money to pay. Could you lend me some today? Does he have plans to see them? Yes, he does. He has plans to see them. They're coming this weekend. Does she have a computer at home? No, she doesn't. She doesn't have one at home. She uses her smartphone. Now practice with me to build your fluency. Are you ready? Feel the rhythm and repeat after me. Do you have time to meet? Yes, I do. Okay. <sighs> Just need to close that player out. Really. That's okay. So 
Okay, so we're back. So we're, we can't show you the whole video, but if you go onto Heart ELT's website, we've actually got some of uh, Jason's um, videos embedded in the site. So there is a page that's called Hope, Peace, Respect, and it's on that page, so you can look at those later. And as I said, you might have, not have internet, but you can use them as a bit of inspiration. I mean, you know, that it's a great combo in that song to actually click your fingers and, you know, it's, uh, rap the songs rather than sing the songs. So, I mean, Jason's motto is that everybody can rap and, uh, you know, because you don't have to really sing, you can actually say the words. So I think it's a great sort of inspiration. And you can go to Jason's website, which is um, fluencymc.com and see uh, more about his teaching and his videos and everything. Um, so we're just going to move on now because we're running out of time and I know that it's going to, it will probably cut out at the end, um, but we're coming to the um, part of the maker space that I want to get you involved in. As you, a lot of you know, a lot of you have been involved with Heart NT, we want to support teachers that are working in difficult conditions and may not have resources. And recycling materials and, and upsourcing materials is a, plays a great part in that. So we're going to actually set you a challenge today um, and we want you to, you have a chance to create your own makerspace badge. Um, so the task is to create two activities based on what you've learned today, um, based on some of the uh, resources that we've shown you today and uh, you're going to share those on the Heart ELT Facebook page um, and then we will, you know, obviously we'll be able to build on those. We can add some teacher's notes, we can add things, and we'll be able to put them on the website under the resource section. So the aim is that you're um, collaborating for change so that you can give to other teachers, share your ideas, and obviously be better teachers. And we can always do with some new ideas. And I just want to give you, show you some things out of my bin bag. I'm handing over for a curse, to Kirsten for a second. Um, some of the things that we could use. So, okay. Let's see if this is what happens here. So, I can't. Boxes. What? More boxes. More boxes. Uh, boxes, bottles. So, I think we, we have to make sure that we get this on camera. Yogurt, yogurt pots. So, boxes, tea bags. Tea bags. Any kind of boxes. Um, this is a great tool. Can make all kinds of things out of egg boxes. So create two activities, send share the ideas on the Heart LT Facebook page or oh you need to talk. Can they hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, I need my headphones back. Yeah. So two activities. Um, share them on the Heart LT Facebook page. You can take a photo and put it up on there. Or if you're a little bit shy about it and you don't want it to be out there, you can actually um, put it in the contact form on heartelt.org um, and send them like that. Also, the other thing that would be great is if you write some blogs on this. We're always looking for guest blogs, short and sweet, 150 words. That will be fantastic if you do a makerspace guest blog for us. So we've got to the end. We've still got sound. We've still got video. We've got our sanity just about. And uh, before we leave you, we just want to leave, leave you with um, some topics that we're going to cover in the next makerspace sessions. Um, we're going to look at easy artwork, fingerprint art, creating cartoons, getting the kids to create cartoons, and again, sharing ideas from the activities that you've post posted on the website, uh, on the Facebook page, or put onto the website. So thanks a lot for coming, and thanks for persevering. Um, and uh, we got to the end. I think we're going to be cut off in a couple of minutes. Um, but there's the links. If you want to order Jason's book, you can go on to Celtic for the physical book. Um, intrinsic books have the downloadable PDF of the book, um, and uh, Jason's website's there. Um, and don't forget the Heart ELT. We've got some really interesting blog posts about the No Resource Classroom, and we've had some very interesting, and we've got a lot of people who want to share those stories with us who are teaching in a, 
a tricky, you know, challenging situation. So I'm just going to hand over to Kirsten to uh, say goodbye. Thanks very much, everyone. So get in touch, of course, if you have any further questions. And if you think about doing this kind of work, get in touch and be prepared because it's the most important thing.